you are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 412. I believe, along with many others, that you must first ask for what you want before you can have it. Wally Amos. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, how to turn your independent film into a profitable business. It's harder today than ever before for independent filmmakers to make money with their films, from predatory film distributors ripping them off to huckster film aggregators who prey upon them. The odds are stacked against the indie filmmaker. The old distribution model of making money with your film is broken and there needs to be a change. The future of independent filmmaking is the entrepreneurial filmmaker or the film entrepreneur. In Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, I break down how to actually make money with your film projects and show you how to turn your indie film into a profitable business. With case studies examining successes and failures, this book shows you the step-by-step method to turn your passion into a profitable career. If you're making a feature film, series, or any other kind of video content, the Film Entrepreneur method will set you up for success. The book is available in paperback, ebook, and of course, audiobook. If you want to order it, just head over to www.filmbizbook.com. That's filmbizbook.com. Now, guys, today on the show, we have 17-time Emmy award-winning filmmaker, Jeff McIntyre. And Jeff is the director of a new film called The Great Cookie Comeback, which is basically a documentary about the founder of Famous Amos Cookies, and how he lost everything and is trying to make a comeback in his 80s. Now, Jeff decided to self-distribute his film because he was getting such ridiculous offers from traditional film distributors, so he thought that he'd have a chance on going at it alone and seeing what he could actually make. You know, and we have, you know, somebody who's, you have a niche of cookie lovers, you have someone who's a celebrity, people who know who Famous Amos is. A lot of things are in his favor with self-distribution. The cost of the film was low, all of those kind of good things. But he had, you know, a few mishaps and a few wins, a few, you know, losses during his misadventure self-distributing. So he wanted to come on the show to talk about the good, the bad, and definitely the ugly of self-distributing a film in today's world. And if you are thinking of self-distributing your film This is an episode you absolutely need to listen to. So without any further ado, please enjoy my eye-opening conversation with Jeff McIntyre. I'd like to welcome to the show Jeff McIntyre, man. Thank you so much for being on the show, brother. Me? Yes. Great to be here, Alex. Thank you. I I appreciate it, man. Can I just say, right, to kick things off, I think I have to state the obvious. Yeah. You know, with everything that's going on in the world right now, I don't think there's any bigger warning sign that the end is near by the fact that Alex booked a failed filmmaker on his show. I mean, come on. If that's not proof, <laughs> the end is coming. Just start digging your bunker. These are desperate times, my listen, friend. Listen, listen my friend. Um, I, 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 I ho- I'm the host, and I'm a failed filmmaker in many ways as well. So don't, don't worry oh. about it. So <laughs> we, we have all failed okay. in one way, shape, or form. So it's Thank all you. good. But I also, also do believe that you learn much more from failure than you ever do from success. So that's 100%. why. 100%. And that's why um, you and I, which are, I'm assuming, similar vintages as far as age is concerned, uh, that we um, <laughs> we we uh, old enough, old enough, sir. Exactly. We have the shrapnel, uh, and uh, and uh, you. What is it? What's that saying? My my wife says it all the time. The devil is more devil because of how long he's been around, how old he is. So it's not because he's a devil. Oh, yeah. He's had more practice. He's right. More practice to, <laughs> to perfect his devilish antics. Exactly. But yes, we have the shrapnel, but we've also got the medicine to help <laughs> soothe the wounds of for, the for people rocky listening, road that he, is in the film. I think he's holding up a uh, wild turkey. Is that? <laughs> no, it's, it, this is High whiskey. West. High this West. Uh, stuff from uh, look at if, that whiskey. If you like good bourbons and whiskeys, they are 
just knocking it out of the park. There you go. There you go. But I know I could see you possibly don't believe me and you need a little proof. So what I'll do for the community, <laughs> I'm taking one for the community. Here. Mm. I feel and this guarantees this show is only going to get better. I, I, I feel that this is going to be a good episode, Jeff. I'm just have a feeling that this might be a fun episode. So first and foremost, Jeff, how did you get into this ridiculous business? <laughs> that is a key word. Um, I'll take you way back to the, the ripe young age of 15. I got started in radio at this cheese ball local radio what, station. What is, it, what is this? What is this? Ra- what is this radio you speak of? I don't understand. Oh, uh, I, I'm is not it like a podcast? <laughs> no, no, no. This was a real, uh, FM radio station back <laughs> in 1985. Right. Uh, <laughs> it was a true cast, yes, not yeah. a podcast. Right, right. And, uh, they eventually acquired even a cheesier, uh, cable access station. So, that's kind of where the ball started rolling. About 16, 17, started doing on-camera stuff. But the real pivotal moment where things really uh, broke open, and I really owe a lot of my career to, was AFI. Mm-hmm. Um, not not the, the film school. Uh, alternative fact interpretation. AFI. Uh, I told a couple really big lies to score some really sweet positions uh, with ABC TV. Mm-hmm. This is back in the 90s, and they a d- desperate spot they needed technicians they needed shooters editors and the bar was so low anyone with a pulse and one working good eye probably could have gotten a gig so i come in i meet with the head honcho this gruff old grizzled news guy yeah hey, well who are you what do you what can you do for me well uh i, I i'm an editor sure, sure i am why not i could be anything the guy wanted that day and granted to that point i had edited um very prestigious productions like weddings and bar mitzvahs. Uh, so I, I understood the basics of cutting, but maybe not on the broadcast news level. But the interview is progressing. Uh, can you edit? Sure, I can edit. You can do news? Well, it would be news to me if I couldn't do news. Wow. Um, wow. So this sounds good. So you'll start tomorrow. I said, oh, just out of curiosity for, for your news business here, what kind of um, uh, equipment do you use to edit your news? Oh, the Sony Arm 450. Oh, of course. Great choice. That's what I'd use. Thank you. I'll see you tomorrow. So I get in the parking lot and I break out my big, huge cell phone and I call a buddy who owns a production company. Okay, great. It's Jeff. I just got this sweet gig at Channel 7, but I have to learn how to edit. Do you have a Sony Arm 450? And he said, come on over. He got me up to speed. And that's what really started the professional ball rolling. And from there, I told some other sweet lies saying, sure, I know how to shoot professional stuff and produce in the field. So they send me to foreign countries. And oh, yeah. that's what I tell uh, young filmmakers and professionals. Don't wait till the door opens for you. The moment you see a crack, you bust through that door mm-hmm. and uh, show up with confidence. Mm-hmm. And if you know in your heart you're not going to screw people over and you probably can learn on the job and do so quickly, um, you do it. Because those opportunities rarely come twice. And that's it. Yep. Those moments. And that is exactly what I did with my fake uh, editing demo reel, which I used by grabbing other people's commercial spots, raw footage, re-editing them, slapping a Nike logo at the end of it. And I would go – and they were like, you know, 20 – like $10 million, $5 million commercials, whatever. Like, But they were foreign raw footage from like Europe. And I was editing – I was working at a production house. I grabbed it all, put it together, sent it out, and I started working as an editor really quickly. (laughs) But you knew you had the skills. You Correct. You not had the opportunity Fake it yet. till you make it. You mm-hmm. back your claims. Correct. That's and the that's thing. Uh, that's the thing. When you're going to fa- you're fake it till you make it, you need to understand that you might have to bend the truth to get in the door, but you've mm-hmm. got to produce once you're in the door or learn on the job and things like that. And I did that multiple times while I was coming up. And I think all big, you know, all, all professionals at one point or another extended the truth of what their capabilities or experience was and figure it out along the way just to get the opportunity. Cause you're right. If you see that crack, you got to bust through that door <laughs> without question. Definitely. It's not like today where we all own the transmitter. Basically we Correct. all have our own channels, but back in the days you and I were coming up, I mean, there were huge oh. gatekeepers. Oh yeah. Gun guarded, gun guarded gates. And they weren't letting you and me in. Mm, that's for damn sure, sir. Now, tell me about your new film, The Great Cookie Comeback. Tell me about it. really prefer not to talk about that film. Um, <laughs> I'd like to talk about some interpretive dance. I, what? Oh, my God. It's gonna oh, be my God. It's going to be a Fine. Long okay, we'll talk about that film. <laughs> so... 
I don't know, too long uh, to admit, about four or five years ago, my producing partner, Jason, he lives in Hawaii, Honolulu, and he crosses paths with this guy named Wally Amos. And um, just by namesake, yeah, Wally Amos, I, I don't know. Uh, I've never heard of him. But then when you learn that he's the Amos behind famous Amos cookies, mm -hmm. which we've all enjoyed at a gas station um, uh, <laughs> near you, <laughs> a vending machine, yeah. yes. Um, and these actually have the shelf life of gravel, um, the packaged version. So th this is good bunker. Uh, good bunker material, so absolutely. You know. um, but back in the day, so Wally Amos, um, the cool thing about Wally, I'm sorry, I, the, the the booze is kicking in. So sure, 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 sure. To focus here. So my, my, my buddy crosses, crosses paths with him, and then uh, the idea is, oh, let's do a reality show with Wally. I'm like, no, no one wants to see a reality show with this 80 plus year old guy. Let's do a documentary. His life is so rich and most people only know him, you know, based on his sweet treats, mm -hmm. but his life before cookies was just uh, jaw droppingly interesting. He was a, a music agent, one of the first black talent agents in the U S worked for William Morris. He discovered People like The Temptations, he signed Diana Ross, Marvin Gaye. He discovered um, uh, Simon and Garfunkel. Jesus. So, the, exactly. So that part of Wally's life is really, really interesting. And so that's how his entree to cookies came to be. He was representing um, an actress, Sherry Summers, who was in Harold and Maude, which is one, mm -hmm. of my, one of my more favorite classic films, uh, very quirky. And as they were finishing up a meeting, Sherry busts out this bag of chocolate chip cookies. And Wally's like, where'd you get these? She's, oh, I, I made them. I just love to make cookies. So Wally started eating them. And it reminded him of uh, simpler days of his past when his aunt used to make cookies. So he went home uh, that night and just started making cookies. He was so, he fell so in love with the process of baking cookies and giving them away that in Hollywood at that time, that became his trademark. Whenever he'd take a meeting, He'd bring a small bag of his famous chocolate chip cookies. So he kind of he had this reputation around town as the cookie man. So um, one night he's meeting with Quincy Jones, his secretary. They're having dinner on the Sunset Strip. And she says, you know, Wally, you and I should start a cookie store. And he left that meeting. And that idea has stuck in his head ever since decades later. So in 1975, Wally opened the very first chocolate chip cookie store. And I know by today's standards, there's, there's, there's candy stores, there's cookie stores. Yeah. Back in the day, there wasn't. He took a big risk to try something brand new, and it, it took off. He became a pop culture icon. He was on every TV show. And for 10 years, he kind of ruled the roost in cookies until he didn't, and he lost it all. But – um should we go there? Do I need to take? I mean, we, we, I mean, we, we, we if they have to watch the movie. They have to watch the movie. So that's. A, I don't want to give it all away. Exactly. Come on. Well, I actually uh, we, we were discussing before we got on air that I actually saw Wally on Shark Tank. He was pitching his new cookies that he was trying to uh, his new cookie company he's trying to launch. Uh, but uh, just to, just just know everyone that watched the movie. But generally speaking, that Wally lost everything. Uh, lost his company. Uh, it, it was pretty. It's a pretty brutal story, a pretty brutal entrepreneurial story, and uh, and then this this documentary is about his comeback. I'm assuming, hence the name, right? And it it digs into some of the pitfalls along his path, and it's it's great lessons for anyone in business. Uh, you don't sign contracts without really understanding what you're signing. The big thing that um, kind of crippled him since the 80s and what he's been trying to overcome ever since when um these companies would take him over he signed away the rights to use his own god-given name and likeness for any future baked good company and that's all he does cookies so they prohibited him for using uh what everyone knows him for and he started like 12 other cookie companies since famous amos but nowhere along the way was he able to say hey you out there, cookie lovers, I'm the guy who started that cookie that you remember and love. That really hurt him. And that's why he didn't get a deal on Shark Tank because um, – He has no access to the his – The woman on that show said, yeah, you're just another random cookie on the shelf now. If we can't tell the public um, who you were. So that was really tough. But I think the, 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 the better takeaway from the film, the inspirational lesson is despite of setback after setback, 
nothing stops this guy. Mm -hmm. He continues to persevere at 85 and he's trying to start his quote unquote final, final cookie company, but nothing slows him down. And that's a great lesson for all of us, especially in this space to (laughs) really hang on to. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. You can never, filmmakers, we have, like I said, we have a sickness that once you're bitten, you can't get rid of it. Um, and it flares up yeah. and it goes dormant, but it's always there. It's always there. Now, um, but you have to be smart in how you manage the symptoms. Exactly. Well, that's good. Work. I like that. I'm going to use that one. I like that one. Hashtag it, baby. And now, um, <laughs> if you don't mind me asking, what was the budget of this documentary? Since I wear all the hats, mainly because I like to cover my bald spot, mm-hmm. um, I shot it, produced it, sure. uh, edited it. Um, so, Hard cash, hard costs were roughly fifteen thousand. Oh, that's and that yeah, included very... everything. It's nothing. Yeah. I try to keep my productions low, and that's very uh, smart. I've been yelling that for the top of the mountain for a long time. Keep your overhead as low as humanly possible. So, fifteen grand for a for a documentary with a known entity like. Uh, Famous Amos, which I mean, everybody, right. you just say Famous Amos, everyone goes, oh, the cookie guy. Oh, this is the documentary about the yep. cookie guy. So, so you actually have a winning formula here. You've got a known person who's very recognizable around the world just by the name, at least. Um, and then you also have very low cost. So this is a perfect, like if you were coming to me and I was consulting you on this, I'd be like, you are a perfect candidate for self-distribution. Without question. So what made you decide to go down the self-distribution route as opposed to going down the traditional route where you could have easily, I think, gotten a distribution deal off of this and you might have even been able to get some sort of MG because of the topic and because of the star of the documentary? One step back before I try to dodge your question. Um, <laughs> So another great thing that was in our benefit, and I think it's smart as filmmakers to really zoom out and survey the entire landscape of what's going on in some of your main subjects' lives. What is their network like? And this was right at the time um, we embarked on this. We knew he was going to be on Shark Tank. Whenever you can leverage Mm -hmm. uh, somebody else's free press. I mean, this episode is rerun probably eight, nine times. And if you or I were to try by a 10-minute slot on that network, forget it. There's no way we could afford that kind of ad, ad money. So that was great to put him back on the radar of public consciousness on that show. And that helped in our efforts. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I'm kind of in the same rocky, leaky boat as other indie filmmakers thinking, well, yeah, let me Google um, film distribution. Let me listen to Alex's show. I know he interviews some distributors now and again. These must be the good guys. So I'll blast them all with emails, links to trailers, get them excited. And I did all that. And I was met with, you know, 90 percent of F you. We have no interest. Thanks. But no thanks. The one or two who who bit um, on the chocolate chip, uh, you know, did the standard uh, crappy offer. Mm-hmm. And threw, they threw the flame in the dumpster to see if I wanted to buy the dumpster before the fire really took off. And um, it was at this time I was getting really frustrated, and that's when I stumbled upon uh, your buddy Rob Hardy had a course, Mm -hmm. uh, Film Audience Blueprint, where it taught you how to go find an audience for your film, uh, identify niches, and then market directly to them. And that course really was an eye-opener because um, at the moment, I knew I couldn't take on Hollywood's marketing machinery. There is no way I can compete with their ad spends, Mm -hmm. match them or outspend them. We will always lose on that front. Mm -hmm. So the the shotgun approach Hollywood uses to spray out their message to everyone, hoping that everyone is their niche and their audience can't work for indie filmmakers. So I thought the only way I could survive this is do a laser targeted niche focus Mm -hmm. with my market. Um, Find the niches that I think the story resonates with and market direct. And through taking this course, it gave me the confidence to step in on my own after getting a couple crappy offers from distributors. And I just felt that I could do better. Maybe not. Maybe I didn't. The first (laughs) round didn't back that principle, but I still have hope um, that when I do launch 2.0, I'll be uh, better armed to make a much bigger splash the next time. So how did you – because now I'm I'm kind of breaking this down and analyzing – the the film and how I would approach it 
it is a niche film, but it's a fairly large niche. So are we talking about, you know, seniors because he's older? Are we talking about entrepreneurs because of who he is? Yep. Are we talking yep. about cookie enthusiasts? Um, <laughs> like, who are your niches? And did how you did you hack my Excel doc, Alex? <laughs> I mean, how, how did, did you do all that? So how did you? Um, First of all, identify those niches and and to thinking and, and and those three niches I just threw out there. Some of them are obvious, some of them are not. Like senior seniors is not an obvious choice, but it is a niche that I think that you could uh, address with this film. How did you first of all pick your niches, and then how did you plan to target them? So we just broke down at its core. What um, are this film's two or three major messages? What uh, groups of people would uh, make them say, hell yes, I want to get to know Wally. I want to hear his story. I want to be moved by it. I want to find similarities. Uh, so seniors, of course. And that um, was just kind of a no brainer based on Wally at the time when we started shooting. He was 82. And his story is so inspirational. And it really plants to seed in other seniors, people who are retired. It's never too late to start a fresh chapter. Mm -hmm. There's always a blank page waiting for you to turn your passion into something profitable to start a business, even if it's crocheting toilet seat covers. If you love crocheting, look at Wally. He turned his love for chocolate chips into a viable concern and it brings him joy. So I think that's a great lesson for um, seniors. And as you know, today, seniors have never been more active. Mm -hmm. So thought they they dig it. And then, of course, there's the. Um, entrepreneurial, the small business owners. And I think when I do my kind of phase two revenue run, I will reach out to business schools and I will cut uh, two different versions of this film to sell to the educational space because his story is so chock full of great uh, business lessons that are timeless, really. Um, and that brings a lot of hope. And I'll also once again, on the phase two revenue scheme, reach out to all these assisted living facilities, retirement communities that are in desperate need of programming. There's activity directors in every one of these um, uh, retirement communities that are dying for fresh content. So instead of just selling them a DVD, I put together a whole activity in a box. So this includes the film, a discussion guide. It includes activities. It, it includes uh, an opportunity to start cl a club. And this really... Um, eases a lot of their pain. Like, what should we do with all these retirees? Well, I think if you could solve other people's problems with your art, I mean, those are just checks that will hit your account eventually. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really the two main niches. I, I considered bakers and, and cookie lovers, but it was too broad early on. Well, um, I mean, to be to be fair, though, like seniors and entrepreneurs are two very broad. Um, they're niches, but they're pretty it, large. They're pretty large. Incredibly. Yes. So maybe I didn't drill down enough. I, I got lazy. And I did. I mean, as you know, this is a grueling process mm -hmm. to make the film, to finally get it out. You, you're pushing it through the creative birthing canal, and it's painful. <laughs> uh, at that point, that's where a lot of filmmakers, they've run out of gas. Not only physical, psychic, creative gas, uh, monetary gas for, for many. And they don't have the juice to take you the next mile. And to me... I know you probably agree. The next mile is the most important. The marketing mile. Oh, absolutely. We better have our best shoes strapped on for that last leg of the journey. Most filmmakers don't understand that before, like when you and I were coming up, making the movie was the toughest part. It was the most expensive right. part. Exactly. There was no yes. access. Um, you know, just doing a color grading session would cost you $300 oh. an hour. <laughs> You know, right, right. It, it was it was insane. But now making the movie technically is the easiest part of the entire filmmaking process. And we've been trained and Hollywood has been putting out this message that you put out all the audio. You, I mean, you put out all the art first and then you hand over the business to somebody else to handle. Where in the new film economy, you've got to know everything from script all the way to how to generate revenue with your film. And if you don't understand that, that last part after that final cut is cut and the deliverables are ready, you're done. You're done. And, and most filmmakers don't get that, but they learn the hard way. They do. And it either drives them away or it makes them stronger once their wounds heal. 
And to me, this this last um, leg of the race, the, the marketing, race, it's it's like it's like climbing a mountain. It's a slog. It's climbing a mountain barefoot through three feet of snow with covid positive piranhas nipping at your heels just to get to the summit. Right. <laughs> right. And for many, the first time they get a blister on their little toe. Oh, I, my feet are I'm going home and, and they throw in the towel. But this is where strength and resilience and perseverance for mm-hmm. us will carry us to the top and get us to the summit where we pop the cork, we celebrate. But not only do I believe is it a win for our own films to make it across the finish line, but it's a win for the whole indie film community because we show it is possible to win. Yeah, absolutely. With self distribution. And the more examples of that, I think the, the more inspiration it will provide other filmmakers who are maybe too scared to you know, go through the pain of the climb. Mm-hmm. So, and that's the vital, I think, where we're at today. That's one reason I released that, that brutally honest case study, because we have to all be more transparent. If we truly are a community, mm-hmm. it's up to us to start sharing our wins and our losses so we can learn from each other. So you, so now you've, dis, you've, you've identified your niches uh, and yes. you've identified your audience and you have your film and you've decided to go self-distribution. What platform did you decide to use or platforms did you decide to use to put the film out online? I guess – Let's one step before that. I had to start generating buzz and market it. Mm -hmm. You want to talk about because I did spend a good amount of time building the Facebook page. Well, let's let's talk about the let's talk about the platform real quick. The next question is all about the marketing. So, what platform did you choose? Got it. I used Gumroad. Okay, and then and you didn't put it on any of the other major platforms, iTunes, Amazon. Oh, Oh, okay. No, thank you, thank you, Alex. I'm sorry. That also is part of phase two. Um, I. Kind of got sidetracked. I wanted to try this launch by myself to market direct to the fans with uh, to sell and rent stream only. Uh, no, yeah, to own or rent the, the film mm-hmm. through Gumroad, which I control the majority of those profits. And then I'm going to do the whole, you know, SVOD, AVOD, TVOD. That still is on the list. Okay. Um, but to date, no, no, I have not ventured into those waters. So I'm excited to get it up on those platforms for sure. All right, so we'll come back to the platforms in your ROI in a second. But how did you now start planning on putting the word out on this film? I think um, two years, two years before I released it, you know, I launched the Facebook page and tried to start building up an audience, producing a ton of original content, custom graphics, uh, memes, uh, clips from the film. So I hustled to um, just drive engagement and to build the numbers. I I, I boosted posts. I put tons of money in Zuckerberg's pocket with Mm -hmm. uh, varying degrees of return. And um, so, I mean, at the end of the day, right before I launched, maybe I had close to 3,000 Facebook fans. Which, and, yeah, which is, it's, yeah. it's, it's not, it, it sounds like a lot, but in the scope of it's, Facebook, it's, it's, it's nothing. Yeah. It's not a whole lot, not for a film launch. Now, Mike, so you decided to focus all of your, your energy towards a Facebook page as opposed to a homepage or a blog or something like that? I, I yeah. nope. Uh, you good, good question. I also had the film's website where I had set up, um, you know, a squeeze page. So, a lot of the campaigns on Facebook would be to drive traffic to the the film website where people I could capture their email, get them on a news, uh, get my email list so I could send them newsletters. Because that's what filmmakers have to. The first thing they need to do is start building their list. That mm-hmm. is so important. Um, and whatever you have to do, I I um, I tried a couple different enticements to see what would move the needle. I offered some people uh, his recipe. For free. For others, it was a discount movie ticket. And then I tracked what gave me the most bang for the buck. And those are called lead generators for people listening. So that's basically yes. a lead. So you give away a freebie of some sort to get people on your list so you can start building a relationship with them and you provide a tremendous amount of value to them with that lead generation, whatever that might be. Could be a video, could be a PDF, could be a recipe, could be a checklist. It could be a thousand different things as long as it's really irresistible to the audience you're targeting. Um, so that, and then if you don't mind asking, how big was your list when you launched? Pass. <laughs> okay. So the email list. Wait, wait, wait. No, damn it. Now, you're driving me to drink again. I think uh, <laughs> I'm at- it was pathetic. Okay. It was truly pathetic. It was, no, it was like 121. 
Okay. So big fail, big fail there. Um, All right. So and, uh, okay. So you brought you brought your so you have a, a small, very small email list, um, and you've you focus a lot of energy on Facebook and you're getting people into your funnel and things like that. So out of all of that, and you have Gumroad as your your main place that you're going to be selling your film. So right. the um, okay, how much did you spend on Facebook ads on your launch? And how many ads did you, spent, did you use? Um, so I ran 121 ads. Now this, okay. keep in mind, this is probably to, you know, through February, into February, right to the launch. Mm-hmm. Um, 121 ads. I dropped $1,383, uh, mm-hmm. not a penny more in ads. <laughs> and, not a, and not a penny more. <laughs> hell no. Zuckerberg got enough of my higher, hard earned money. Yeah, yeah, How yeah. dare he? Yeah. Um, and and then uh, this is a, just to build on your last point why it's absolutely crucial to own your audience's info mm-hmm. because with one algorithm change poof all um your connection to your potential fan oh, it's are gone. gone you don't want any other social overlord to control your fan base you must be able to reach out directly and communicate with your people. That's why you have to build a list. Well, that's exactly what happened with Facebook originally. If you remember, like we're talking about eight years ago or something like that, you used to be able to post something on your Facebook page and right. 30, 40% of people would see it. Yeah. Now it's a half a percent um, for free. It, it, unless it goes viral, unless it gets shared, or unless something else happens organically, generally speaking, it's pay to play. So that changed the business model for millions of companies around the world, millions of people around the world overnight. So you always have to play in your own sandbox. You have to control the sandbox because when you play in somebody else's sandbox, you play by their rules. YouTube did the same thing. People were making a lot of money off of their ads and all of a sudden Facebook just went, eh. Amazon, their affiliate marketing pack, they turned, oh, nope, no more. And people lose their mind. So, cause you are, you're completely dependent on that platform. So, a hundred percent agree. The email list is the most powerful thing any marketer has. More powerful than a million, two million followers on Facebook. It, it doesn't mean anything. And you're exactly right. And to do it again, I would have focused more effort on, pointing all my ads to that landing page. But keep in mind, and I think a lot of indie filmmakers suffer from this early on, we really <clears throat> we get drunk on the dopamine. Mm-hmm. Seeing the likes and shares, it is intoxicating. They like me. They um, really like me. <laughs> oh, my God. I don't have to spend money on a therapist. I just have to post something, and I'm loved. <laughs> but – Listen up, you damn indie filmmakers yes. and hustlers. This is really important. Never confuse the like button with the buy button. Mm-hmm. One causes a temporary chemical reaction. The other produces a long-lasting financial one. And never get wooed in by a like or a share because those are meaning, they're vanity metrics that won't pay your rent. You can't call your landlord and say, oh, you know what, uh, this month's rent um, – I'm a little short. Do you take likes? Can I? <laughs> I, I can no. give you. I can give you twenty thousand followers. Is that? Does that pay my right. rent? Okay. Well, that may have some value if you're offering. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it doesn't. Because if you're just giving followers away, this it doesn't. It doesn't work. You could buy followers. It's right. It's, you could buy empty. Like tomorrow, you can spend. I think. I think the number is like twenty or thirty thousand dollars, and you can have a million followers. And seriously, that's literally the cost of of buying followers. Um, but it means nothing. It's complete vanity because you – they're people, they're robots or they're fake accounts or they're people from oh, God knows where who have no interest in what you're doing. So it's basically just like look how cool I am. I remember I spoke to a filmmaker that that decided to spend – I think he spent like $7,000 on YouTube views to get his trailer to be viewed over a million times. And the movie cost like – you know, it was like a low budget fifty thousand dollar like action horror film or something right. like that, with like you know, I think Michael Madsen was in it, um, or Eric Roberts or something like that. So, and he was used in his his mind, um, and he was a little bit out there as far as ego is concerned, and that's saying a lot because we're all crazy. Um, but he then called all the film distributors, like, look, there's a million people who saw our film, you've got to buy it. Guess what? It didn't really work. And they lost eight thousand eight thousand dollars because of it. Because that's vanity. Total vanity. It, it's um, com- complete and, vanity. 
And that's the thing, you know, likes can be bought, but sales have to be earned. Mm -hmm. And, and before you can, the thing is with sales, uh, especially with independent film, um, you've got a, your, your value proposition has to be massive. If you're, if you're trying to go outside the normal world of like iTunes, Amazon, places where people are very comfortable, um, spending their money because their credit card's already on file. They just click a little button and it's, it's right. done. When you're going to a platform like Gumroad or Vimeo, uh, Vimeo or something like that, that they, they are, uns- they don't know who this is. So now you want me to pull out my credit card, type it into the site that I have no idea about to watch a documentary about cookies or to watch an independent film that I made about filmmakers running around Sundance. Like it doesn't, you know, it's, it's, it's not, it's not a good business strategy. Uh, and I love Gumroad. Don't get me wrong. I think they're great. Um, and VHX before they were bought by Vimeo was great as well. Right. But it, you're adding another few layers to the process, which creates, uh, less sales. So let me ask you, um, uh, since you've been so for, for forthcoming with your numbers, out of that thousand, what was it, $1,100 and 83 cents? 1383. 1383. Okay. 1383. <laughs> right. Out of that 1383, what was your ROI? What was your return on investment? So these numbers, I think, cover the first two weeks of launch. That was the whole point of that video to say, hey, this is what self distribution can do for you if you follow all the steps the gurus give you. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, the grand total that week, was thirty six dollars and ninety four cents. Now that's a t- that's thirty six American <laughs> USD. My USD. friend, no Bitcoin. I, okay, but, <laughs> but, but but keep in mind. But then I it, it was that was already depressing enough. But then I said, oh, it's not thirty six because to test Gumroad, I did a <laughs> couple test transactions. Oh, so now man. I have to. So the grand total now. Let me check my math here. Was twenty nine dollars and ninety six cents. For a launch wow. of a film that took five years, thirteen hundred and eighty-three bucks uh, in advertising. Um, wah, wah, wah. Yeah, exactly. For plan. Yeah. So, so do you mind if I can kind of dissect this the situation a little bit? Get your chainsaw out. Uh, I want. I want to. I want to because I want to. I think this is a really great, and I think why you put the video out originally, and I will put that in the show notes. That video is amazing. That it's like forty, almost an hour. Um, yeah, it's, it's insane. A manifesto. It's a yeah. manifesto. It's a fantastic video. <laughs> um, I think because you, you want to help filmmakers, so I think this is a great learning moment. So you did a lot of the concepts right. You you found an, you you have a niche product which is a niche a film that's aimed at certain groups, which you could arguably get to. Um, it is a valuable, a, pro- a good value proposition because there really isn't anything like this out there. Um, yeah. And then the, now that's the good stuff. And you, and you, you, you wanted to self distribute, you put it on a platform so you can control the money. Also good. Um, there's a lot of that stuff. And then you started doing targeted Facebook ads and you even started building an email list. To a certain extent. So I think you've discussed it already. We said it already. The, the biggest mistake you made is all these ads that you were spending money on were not into a funnel, were not directly aimed at that email building list. Now, real quick before you slaughter me. Um, <laughs> I don't want, a of, I don't want to Good point. You. No, no, I, I <laughs> Guys, I'm not beating him up, guys. Listen, I'm not beating him up. No. We, this is why no, we're he's here. Not. No, he's being incredibly <laughs> kind. Um, Two other things I did uh, or I attempted to do, but um, the other parties bailed on, but I really believe in, and I think this is really key for especially documentary filmmakers. I reached out to influencers who I felt um, would uh, gel with this film, who who have an audience that totally would love Wally's message. And let's say, for example, uh, a business blogger, one of the top business uh, bloggers has a podcast, a decent audience. And I analyze, and I think every filmmaker, you should come up with a spreadsheet where you, you put you list all the influencers that, that could relate to your niche. And then you also put um, all other social numbers. How many followers do they have? That's important. You want to align yourself with big, beefy networks. Um, I reached out to him. I said, hey, listen, I want to try something new for marketing a film. I'd like to work with you and create a course. I want to create a course that um, uses Wally's story to really drive home some of the principles you teach, uh-huh. uh, part of your mission statement. And you, you'll watch the film, 
you'll pull out five key business lessons in this film, and then I'll produce it for you. We offer it to your audience as an add-on to the film. Or if you want to give it away uh, as a value add, great. But uh, you make a course because, as you know, courses are huge. And all these guys are looking for fresh content. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I thought it would have been a slam dunk. And I got one or two people on the hook, and then they just they vaporize. But I think that is key because then they, they have skin in the game, and they're going to work to promote this course that they can then monetize themselves. So I recommend that. Yeah, absolutely. Education, online education, especially post COVID is, um, is yes. huge, 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 huge. Uh, and as I'm sure you following what I do, I've, I've added a tremendous amount of education to my oh, business. Incredible. Um, yeah. and, I, and that's something that I've, because that's what the audience wants. That's what my, my, my tribe wants, what my customers want. Um, and the people that I, I'm, I'm trying to serve want. Um, so yes, absolutely. In my book, film, uh, rise of the film entrepreneur, I talk about courses as one many of many ways you could do it. So to break, get back to your, yeah. So that was, an so aside, to break down. Yeah, so like, uh, if I was going to, if I was going to go down this road with this film, um, I would have first and foremost, I would have seen if there was, you see, you couldn't go after another cookie company cause he's competing with another cookie company so that, that you can't kind of leverage that. You might have to, you can maybe find some sort of entrepreneurial organizations, um, nonprofits, things like that, that you could have maybe partnered with, um, to get the word out, get on their email list, start leveraging their emails list. Um, and then why you haven't created a course specifically on entrepreneurial course of your own based off of his, that's something you should be doing because I think you'll make a lot more money selling that course off of his yeah. name and, and cut him into right. it, by the way, and cut, you know, give him. Oh, I yeah, ab- I plan to. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. So you, you partner with him on a course, on entrepreneurial course, and that's a huge, that would be a huge, huge moneymaker revenue. It's kind of like really low hanging fruit in my mind where I see this personally as the film is a lead, a lead generator. It's a, it's a loss leader. There is, if you can make some money with it, great. But if you can't, it's all good. You should be able to generate enough other things um, that could do it. Like if you could reach out to uh, Sir Sir Latab or um, those kind of like chefy bakey kind of companies, and see if you can incorporate the, into their world somehow, where you give the movie away. Look, um, Fact Sick and Nearly Dead did this so beautifully. Yes. Uh, I use them as a case study in my book, and he literally gave the movie away, and he partnered with the Breville juicer in the movie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And now when I went to go buy my Breville juicer, because that's the juicer I was going to buy, because that's the movie I saw, so it was great marketing. Right. I went to Bed Bath & Beyond, and when I went to go buy it, guess what was sitting right next to it? A DVD of the movie. Mm-hmm. If you buy it, you get a copy of the movie for free. And it, it just was – he built Brilliant. an entire business around this concept of juicing. Um, there's potential for that here in the cookie side of things, in the baking side of things. You can partner with uh, – Companies in regards to um, how you how you create uh, you know baking educational baking uh, packages. There's so many different things that you can do to kind of combine him and and uh, the film and trying to generate other revenue sources. Obviously, t-shirts, uh, hats, aprons, uh, baked goods, things like that. But if you're able to create this, but you're now creating an ecosystem uh, with right. your film, and if you can create that ecosystem, and I think that's one place where you could you could do probably a bit better now is is actually not focused on so much on the getting the revenue from the movie itself, but from all these other revenue sources because it is a it's a it's a absolutely film entrepreneurial play like it, the movie is a giveaway almost. Hundred percent, and there's a real evergreen quality to it too. Absolutely. Um, and that's something like I said for phase two, it's institutional sales too. It's reaching out. Like I said, to the, the senior homes, business yeah. schools, and, right. and, and repackaging it in that form. And I think, I, I forget which hotel chain, maybe um, Radisson, they, one of their trademarks is they actually leave out hot chocolate chip cookies for guests. So I've, um, a while back, you know, I, I tried to in, be in contact with them to why not put Wally's face on these cookies or use his recipe and we could put the D we could stream the movie on the, the hotel, mm-hmm. uh, video on demand systems for a couple months. Airlines, 
Um, All there day. was a Midwest Express. Uh, uh, it was a Wisconsin-based airline years ago. It used to give out hot chocolate chip cookies. Oh, yeah. Once again, Pivot give out Wally's new cookie, and you get to watch his the movie free in the um, in, in the seat back or stream it. In on is the there plane. a package? So, is there, is, do you have a, a package where you get cookies and the movie mm-hmm. for sale? Early on, yes. But once again, the thing with Wally is when we embarked on this this journey, he actually – had kind of a good thing going. He had started a cookie company called Cookie Kahuna, which yeah. when you watched him on Shark Tank, that was the company he was promoting. But wouldn't you know it, a couple months before we release, he splits from that company. Thank you. Moment oh, of God. silence. Oh, moment of silence. And then for all the money that's left on the table. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to pull the bottle up again uh, and drink. I already <laughs> did that when it happened. But yeah, he really threw us for a curve. But then the story only got a little more juicy because then he he had to do so. He had to leave his home state to try to start another company, and he was a victim of elder abuse in this other state he went to. So the story got really wacky. Um, but yeah, that's just kind of in true Wally form. He's and he'll tell you he's never been a good businessman. He's a great marketer, but he never truly, you know. Understood okay. the whole business thing. Well, I mean, but even right. even even that you can go down to Costco and buy cases of famous Amos cookies and package them yourself right. and sell them. <laughs> I mean, you could arguably, right? <laughs> there is, yeah, there is exactly. You know, like if it's like, look, I mean, if you could you could do something like that. I mean, there is there is um, there's a lot of potential here. Um, I think you said yes. this. You said this in the in your video. It's like it wasn't lack of plan as much as it was execution, um, and figuring out 100%. those kind of dialing in those certain things. Because of like if I was trying, like it's serious. Like if I sat there and started thinking about how to market this, I would be creating uh, bigger value propositions like crazy, like cookie packages and baking and all these other kind of revenue streams and seeing what I can leverage as far as um, audiences through other companies and things like that, as opposed to going down the road of, and influencers are great um, and going down the business side is great. And I love your ideas with the senior living and the um, cruise lines and and airlines Mm -hmm. and uh, business schools and, and all that. That's excellent. I know, I know one Documentary filmmaker made over a million dollars with a senior based uh, film well, with the age of champion guys. Yeah. Keith yeah. Those guys. Yeah. And Chris. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, they killed And them. I based a lot of this on them. They're incredible what they did. Yeah. And I think you could go to that same senior living convention once COVID is done. Right. And yes. sell and sell yes. licenses there. I just, just no question. You could do that as well. So there is definitely a bright future for the great cookie comeback. There is definitely a bright future. Um, so we've discussed what you've done right and a few things that you did wrong as well. Um, let me see. Hold on a second. Because uh, we covered a bunch. Now, did the, so, so, yeah, we covered a lot of stuff already. <laughs> I mean, if you want to if you want to dive into, I did get a couple offers from distributors. So, OK. So with distributors specifically, because I'm I, let me tell you what the let me see if I can guess. So – Okay, yes. let me see so, if I can guess these deals. Um, no money up front. No MG. So no MGs. Okay, great. So no money up front. I'm going to say it's going to be an eight to 10 year length, give or take. If I was lucky, but okay. I'm yeah, all prior. right. A little 15 years. Yeah. yeah. I was trying to be nice. It's about 15, it's about 15 years, right? Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah. Then there was uh, also um, call, the marketing expenses, of course, which they'll cap. Um, and it's going to range, I'm going to say on the less predatory side, 50,000 on the more predatory side, a hundred thousand. Um, a little lower, but yeah. Um, 40,000, 30,000. I don't think they, they, yeah, yeah. Like 20, 20,000. Okay. That, that was actually, that's not a bad marketing cap, but then that means you'll never see. Not, I'll never see anything. Anything. You'll never see anything. It's basically right. a loss leader at that point. Um, those were the deals you were gotten, but that's the standard deal. And if you would have been uh, a lesser filmmaker in the sense of in your knowledge, you would have just bought bid on one of those and prayed because you're like, Oh, it only cost me 15 grand. You know, I'll, I'll, I'm sure I'll get at least that back. Um, never, which you won't, which you won't. 
And thanks to guys like you and Rob Hardy, I mean, you've, you're really um, rattling the cages and shouting this from the mountaintops <laughs> and you're keeping us awake and it's all of our responsibilities to stay sober and not be wooed. Cause once again, just like likes and shares, it's very intoxicating when you get an email, a return email from a distributor. Oh my God, they like my film. And then, you know, the, the Hollywood red carpet fantasy starts playing in your, in your mind, mm -hmm. but no, you have to shut that down. You got to pull the plug on that projector. Um, because it rarely ever works out that way. And, um, it's just, it's like waiting. It's, it's high school prom all over again, where you wait till a week before the big dance to ask a girl out and your options are so limited by then. And you're really nervous and you're desperate. They all smell that on you. And you get a bunch <laughs> of no's and then day three, two days before the prom. And eventually this one girl says yes. And you're so uh, uh, elated and relieved despite her reputation. Uh, <laughs> she still said yes. Right. The, the chances that she'll show up or, or actually be there at midnight or dance with you. Uh, when Cindy Lauper comes on time after time, well, obviously, very low. isn't this the beginning of every Blake Edwards film? <laughs> I think so. And maybe that's what I'm channeling now. <laughs> that's right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, like, Blake Edwards. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then, oh, and then by the end of the evening, absolutely no distributing will be going on. <laughs> no, I, I, there'll be no distributing. None. No distributing. <laughs> no distributing. <laughs> at all is going to happen. Um, now, did you think of possibly going with a film aggregator to get your film up on these platforms? Is that something you're thinking about yes. doing? A hundred percent. And this is an area that I really haven't dipped my toe in the water enough. I mean, film hub uh, seems very intriguing. No, oh, I'm sorry. That was Are just a twitch in my neck. I apologize. Oh, 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 gotcha. I think it was Freudian. I'm going to re replay the video. <laughs> um, but aside from them, <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, who should I call? We're all, all of us are on the edge of our futons, Alex. Um, <laughs> what are some good aggregators? <laughs> Futon. I'm um, teetering on the edge. Well, because because of the um, the whole distributor debacle and and how yeah. I heavily promoted them for two years, it's one of the reasons ah, why I came right. out so heavily, guns a blaring against them when I found out what happened. Um, I tr I try not to recommend any specific mm. company because a company that could be Got good it. right now is not a company that's going to be good six months from now. And I found that anytime I release one of these podcasts, they are evergreen. And I hear people are like, oh, I, I went with this distributor because they were on your show. And then I'm like, oh, but they're not good anymore um, because they did this or that and their company is this now. And I have to delete that episode. So I – Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I've, 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 I've become, ever since distributor, I've become very militant. So I, I, if I, if I hear any negative thing about a past company or, or guest that I've spoken to that could possibly harm filmmakers, I go back and delete it and I delete it from everywhere. Well, thank you. On, on behalf of all of us, thank you because we do look to you and others in the space for kind of sage advice because we don't have access to these big guys. So you're in a really, I think, a, uh, a unique position and you know it to be able to, to bring us uh, people that we cannot connect with. So we take that to be almost an endorsement when I get your position. But the, the deal I got was from a guest from one of your past podcasts, a distributor that I have to check your library to see if they're still on. Not to say – Oh, I know they, who they are. Sharks. Oh, I, I know exactly God. who – you just by the terms, I knew who they were. And they are, right, no, lo exactly. and they are no longer on the, on the podcast. Right. Yeah, rhymes with crappy toss, but um, <laughs> which was the nature of the deal. <laughs> it's really trip. No one will get that. <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about, sir. Um, I'm sweating. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, oh, what a world! What what, what a world! It is. It, it is. Uh, it's it's an insane world, and it's getting insaner. Um, you know, can 2020 be over with, please? Um, uh, is a general statement, <laughs> let alone everything else. If I would have told you in January that not only will the entire world shut down and the economy would shut down in the United States, but all movie theaters will be closed. There would be no summer blockbuster season whatsoever, um, without any real foreseeable future of, um, movie theaters coming back to what they are and that the only lone film that might hold some sort of theatrical hope and it's a it's a it's a hail mary not because of the film but because of the circumstance is a film that has 
very few stars in it, and it's based on a f- uh, based on an original IP created by Christopher Nolan called Tenet, and and right. yes. that and, and and don't get me wrong with Robert Patterson and stuff like that, but you know they're not. It's not a giant Marvel film, so. Actually, the Marvel, DC, and James Bond films were pushed because <laughs> they were scared. But they're hoping the tenant might open, and they're still talking of like, as of this recording, eh, you know, it might, we might, we might hold on to it. I don't know. That's a two hundred million dollar plus gamble theatrically, big time. And by the way, yeah. you have to watch that film theatrically. That's the way you watch a Christopher yep. Nolan film. You watch right. it in IMAX if at all possible. But. If I would have told you all of that, you would have said, Alex, you're insane. You're insane. Put the bottle down, Alex. <laughs> Come on. Exactly. But that's the world we uh, live in. And, and I've been, and, you know, I've been saying this for a while that Rome is burning. Uh, and, and the coronavirus, unfortunately, has added a lot of um, gasoline to that fire in our industry. And it's, gonna, it's never going to die, but it will shift. Uh, and us as filmmakers need to shift with it, need to pivot, need to figure out new ways to make this work and use the new technology at our disposal that we can use to empower us let alone, instead of it defeating us. So to go back to what you were saying, as far as aggregators are concerned, I'm not sure that it makes financial sense to go with an aggregator for your mm-hmm. film. And I'll tell you why. Because okay. if you're spending money uh, to get on iTunes for TVOD. No, never. I never do iTunes. Okay, so – for a film like this, there's so little – what I've heard, there's so little return on investment. I'm not going to spend a grand and a half to make $24. Correct. No. Exactly. So Through iTunes. So iTunes, yeah. you're not going to – well, first and foremost, TVOD as a general statement is pretty much a dead – it's dead for independent filmmakers unless you could drive traffic. I agree. Unless you could right. drive tremendous amount of traffic to those spaces, then mm-hmm. you can make – but being found organically, yet not – not going to happen. So um, iTunes, Google Play, Fandango, and those kind of TVOD places, not yeah. worth it. Amazon, you could upload yourself. It will take a lot longer if you upload it yourself uh, other than if you would went with you know another a distribution company or an aggregator. But you could up do it yourself, and they do take a big chunk, but they are the biggest um, marketplace where everybody's on it and everybody's comfortable – Hitting that 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 rental. Definitely. I, if you're gonna put it on TVOD, I would put it up for ninety nine cents because it's better mm-hmm. than the three cents you're gonna get per hour screened um, on Amazon Prime. So that would be my suggestion. Don't spend three to four five thousand dollars with an aggregator to get them on all these platforms because that's a mistake that a lot of filmmakers make. And you really should try to focus your energies as much as you can on one major platform, if at all possible. And I think Amazon will probably be the best bet for you. If you can find a way to get on AVOD, that's where I yes. think your money is going to be made. Um, and right. I, I think AVOD is right now, as, as of this recording, AVOD is where the money is. And I agree. Like Tubi TV. Tubi, Pluto, um, Peacock yep. uh, is coming out. Uh, there's so many right. of these, um, these AVOD platforms coming out where that's the only place people are making money right now. In six months, I have no idea. In a year, I have no idea. But right now, that's where money is made. Like, like when I released my first feature, I sold it to Hulu. That's not possible mm. now. Not, no. not, not possible now. Not I, sold, I actually sold it to China through a foreign distributor. Not possible wow. now. <laughs> not possible no, no. now. Um, so there's moments of time that things are available. Like there was a moment for TVOD in 2010, 11, 12, 13. TVOD was kill. It was killing it. SVOD was nah, yeah. and there was no AVOD. Then SVOD started picking up and, and so on. Um, you might, and this is a big might, you might want to talk to a good qualified producer's rep to see mm-hmm. if they can pitch it to um, a Netflix or a, a, a streaming platform and see if they would take it, take it on. Um, I actually will – Glenn Reynolds and Sebastian Tordes, both mm-hmm. of them have been on the show. Uh, they're both really good producer's reps who actually – do what they say they can do, and they actually care about filmmakers. Might be a possibility. No, they don't exist. Come I on. know they're they're unicorns. They're actually unicorns in the space, but um, that might be a possibility as well. Um, again, right. it's a conversation. It's a conversation. It is and, not a, a guarantee, but it's a conversation. It's 
it's worth having. I, I did speak with a couple of producers reps and they just really turned, I, I like in your other job, do you sell used cars? Yeah. They're, they're really slick and slimy. Yeah. And most producers reps, most sales agents, um, you know, a lot of them are very predatory and a lot of them are very slick. Oh yeah. I can get you this. Oh, I can get you that. And I can yeah. do this and I could do that. And like, you know, look, guys, do you believe you can make some money with this film? Make a freaking phone call, submit it to Netflix. If you make it, we're going to cut, we'll cut, we'll cut the deal. All right. If not, forget moving it. On. Yeah. Moving on. Yeah, you know, exactly. um, that's what I need you for. If you can make it happen, great. Well, let's cut a deal. If not, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of money for one platform, you know, or, or this or that. It's just not that kind of film. Um, but those, those are, those are some of the avenues I think you can go down. But uh, listen, man, I, I appreciate, um, Jeff that you've come on. And um, talk so freely about this process. It is a rarity. I do anytime filmmakers want to do this. I generally, if it's a good story, I definitely want to bring them on the show because I've had a few of these bad distribution story kind of uh, situations on the show and they're very popular. People love them. And I think it's a real good service to the community to actually hear people who are in the trenches going through it, figuring it out. But what I love about you is that that was 1.0, release 1.0. Now you're planning release 2.0, which is a whole other world. Um, And please let me know what happens with release 2.0. I'd love to hear what happens how you were able to generate revenue. I think you have a lot of potential with this film. There's a, it's just, there's a lot of money that could be made um, and it could help a lot of people too watching this insp- inspirational wise and, and things. And, and that's the goal, turning a loss into a win. And these are all, I think losses are real, they're teachable moments and mm-hmm. to lean into it. Cause I was kind of, in, uh, part of me struggled. Do I really want to release this to the world and say, Hey, I failed. But um, the community has <sighs> been really supportive. And um, and I have to give a shout out. You know who kind of inspired this was a guest you had on your show, Naomi. Yes, McDougal. Naomi McDougal Jones. Right, her her bite me film. She did the whole cross country mm-hmm. tour and the bus. She's amazing. And she cut an incredible YouTube series, which I implore every filmmaker to watch. Mm-hmm. Her little se- her road trip series. It is she available. It's content. available on uh, on Indie Film Hustle TV. Oh, wonderful! Watch it. You'll learn a ton and maybe it'll light a fire under you. Yeah, she uh, was great. Try something new. And she interviewed a couple filmmakers who then I brought on as well who, who had a horrible distribution uh, oh. deal as well. And they, they actually right. were like – they were brutal. They just like, oh. this is the company and this is what they did to me. <laughs> And they haven't paid me, so screw them. And this is don't say. I'm like, okay, all right, let's do this. Yeah, how do you really feel? <laughs> yeah, but th- that's so important. Um, and to your audience, I just want to follow up with thank you for posting the, the 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 manifesto. But to let everyone know, if they actually make it through that and they're still standing, mm-hmm. um, we want to continue the educational process and offer a free course. Yeah, that's where I teamed up with Rob Hardy, your buddy. And for people who watch the video, they could opt in and we, we were like delivering over an hour and a half of free content to arm people with the right steps to find a niche and market to them directly. That's um, awesome. That's totally free. Yeah, I'll put, it, I'll put all that in the show notes without question. Thank now, you. what's, ne- what's Thank next you. for you? So uh, <laughs> two days after the lockdown orders came and you're in L.A., you remember those texts the, the, the mayor sent out. I'm, I'm, st- I'm still um, getting, I'm still getting texts about the riots, sir. So, Oh, right. The curfew. Oh, we're, <laughs> we're cutting it close. We have, we better wrap this up and shut the shades. But, uh, I had met a guy at a, a party in, um, a couple of months earlier. And this party, I only found out the next day on Facebook. It was a who's who of former child stars. Like every child actor was at this party. It was a, a birthday party for a guy I used to go to junior high with. And he actually was a pretty big child star, Keith Coogan. His grandpa was Jackie Coogan. He was in. What's that name? He was in like, uh, okay, he was in uh, Adventures in Babysitting. Don't tell mom the babysitter's dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Toy Soldier, every '80s TV show. So I contact this guy who hosted the party, who happened to be a screenwriter, and I said, "Hey, Ryan, um, we're not doing anything now. Let's do something wacky and creative. Let's come up with a show that we could, you know, put child actors in um, and shoot it all on Zoom." So we came up with the first kind of scripted Zoom comedy. It's called The Quarantine Bunch. And we've got like six former child stars on here. Even Ted Lange from The Love Boat. Isaac, he makes an appearance and some other guest stars. And it's a hoot. The premise is all these child stars, you know, the reputation, they're all a little. Yeah, yeah, crazy. Let's let's call for it. Thank you. You said it. Um, 
so they used to have a support group where they met in person, but since oh. the quarantine, now they have all their meetings on Zoom where everyone could tune into their drama. So the quarantine bunch was born, and it's a fun little show, but it just shows the necessity of being able to pivot when you can no longer produce content in a way you're used to. We have to quickly turn on a dime and, and channel our creativity in another format. In, in, um, well, you, first of all, you had me at support group. Um, now, um, <laughs> but like, and, and this is something that filmmakers of today don't understand is that, you know, when you and I were coming up, it, everything was pretty well established. Like yes. things really cool. hadn't changed in, I mean, occasional little things here. VHS showed up. It kind of threw a little monkey wrench in. Right. Then, um, then DVD showed up. Cable. Remember cable was going to knock oh, everything wow. out. Z channel, select TV. Yeah. yeah. All right. this. Uh, so there's things. And then, you know, but then it's st- once it, once Netflix showed up in, in 08, re- in, in the, in the streaming space, not in the other space, in the DVD rental space, but in the streaming space, everything's accelerated so quickly that the marketplace, the technology, everything has changed so much. Prior to the nineties, really, I mean, when I went to, when I went to college, I learned on a flatbed, but I also learned on that Sony and the CMX 3600. Let's, let's start dating yes, myself, yes. the Grass Valley as well. Uh, but yeah, then yeah. I, I used the, um, now this is for the for the old folks listening. The montage as my editing. Yes, yes the montage. Right. The montage was the the nonlinear editing system I learned on, which was on Windows three one one. Um, and then I would take the floppy and walk it over to the CMX thirty six hundred, plug it in, and try to get that EDL to work, which it never did. Um, Good luck. It never did. But then by the time I graduated. Um, DV uh, mini DV started showing up and then HD started yeah, showing up right, and right. then Avid showed up and then every, so it was kind of like, it was just weird. I was right in the middle of the shift. So I, I, a lot of the stuff I learned in school was pretty much useless. Like I, I know what time code is. I know what drop frame is, you know, all this kind of stuff that I, I needed back then betas, SPs and digi betas and all that stuff. I mean, all that kind of crazy title safe. Oh, titles. I can remember titles. My, my <laughs> wife works in uh, movie trailers, uh, movie yeah, marketing, yeah. and the, the, the young bucks who come in there, um, when they, they kick back a spot because it wasn't QC'd properly, and yeah. they come to my wife and say, oh, what, what's this thing called? Uh, titles? titles? <laughs> aren't aren't it not say, titles safe already? Because they're on a screen. No, nothing's threatening them. Oh, um, my God. But yes. Yeah, it's these little things. Uh, but, but then, but but now, then it did. No, no, but that, but then you have to pivot because things started changing so rapidly. You know, I went from a, an avid editor to a final cut editor because I couldn't find any right. work as an avid editor in my market because there, everybody started using final cut because everyone started all these in-house agencies and, and in-house uh, production companies started buying final cuts because it was more affordable. So I learned that. Then I right. jumped into color. Then I jumped into post supervising. Then I was directing, you know, not just commercials, but other things. So it was just this constant pivoting and shifting where if you, you're like, Oh, I'm only going to make my movie this way and I'm going to get it out this way. You're done. You've got to pivot. You've got to be able to change. And you have to continue to evolve. If you don't keep evolving, you start devolving and Mm -hmm. then you do a circular spiral back into the earth from where you came. And I think (laughs) for a lot of, a lot of filmmakers, the seed is planted. I'm, you're a movie guy. The seed is planted early on when we went into the theater. Oh. We were mesmerized by the flicker, the 24 frames per second flicker of dreams on the screen. And we love these icons, our, our, our film heroes. And a lot of filmmakers still think that's the only way they can produce their, their craft, their art, is through the template that their icons used. Correct. And that doesn't – I remember I was I remember I was coming up and I just – in 2005, I released the DVD – um, that I sold to uh, to filmmakers about how I made a movie, a short film back then. And in 2005, oh. there was no online education. There was no educational products for independent filmmakers. I know it's hard to believe, but there was none. And I decided um, at that point, I, and I made $100,000 off of a short film and, and, and we sold 5,000 units and we did a lot of great stuff back then. But I was, right. if you go back to YouTube, I actually have, the first tutorials, filmmaking tutorials up on YouTube. It's still there. 
Uh, oh, that's awesome! And I, but I do stop. cringe when you watch it. Uh, no, it's actually really fun. Oh, they're, they're fun. I mean, they're an SD and they're your, your hair was quality. nice. That, that, uh, yeah, yeah. I look, I look yeah. so much better than I do now. Um, but, oh. um, but the, the the problem, the point is that I decided not to keep going down that educational route. One, because no one knew what YouTube was going to be, and no one knew what the whole. I didn't see that much ahead. But secondly, I said, "Well, Spielberg never did this. Why should I?" Scorsese never uh, did this. I, I'm yes. not going to like I don't yes. I'm not going to be an educator. I'm not going to go down this road or do something else that my icon my my idols didn't do. And you can't think that way. You've got to think about what's new, what's the space, what's the technology, what are the platforms? How can I get my message out? How can I move my career forward? When I jumped into podcasting 5 years ago, there was a lot of podcasts out there. But not nearly as many yes. as there are now. It's in the filmmaking space. Now it's everybody has a filmmaking podcast. But I'm one of the few that have stayed. I'm, I'm one of the few that survived these last five years where a lot of my contemporaries decided to just, you know, leave. Um, but it's because I found that niche. I was like, oh, well, there's not, there's somewhere here. I can make some noise here uh, as opposed to jumping onto YouTube and trying to do it there. So it's always about pivoting. It's always about shifting and, and adjusting and putting more tools in that toolbox. And staying persistent. And I think that's really at the foundation of your success is you remain vigilant and persistent. Mm -hmm. And where most don't. Once again, we come back to the the, the views um, conundrum where it's tough to create content these days. There's a lot of competition. There's so much noise out there. Signal to noise. Oh, my God. How do you pierce through it? And it is only through consistent creative output. And that's a lot of work to feed the beast. But then when you don't get the views, the social proof, I mean, it's easy just to turn tail and say, you know what? I put eight videos up. They didn't hit. I'm going home. I'm trying something new. So to, to stick with it and get over the hump like like you did with your podcast, mm-hmm. that's really the formula for success these days. Oh, just show it's up. Just, just digging down. Huh? Just sh- showing up is half the battle. 100%. And you don't have to be perfect. Don't wait till you have it all. Just you, go. you learn as you go, but keep producing. Absolutely. Building your library. Absolutely. No question. Yeah. Now, I'm going to ask you if you get a question to ask all my guests. What advice would you give a filmmaker wanting to break into the business today? I'd say really explore a good trade school. I mean, refrigerators always need repairing. <laughs> Plumbers are in demand, especially Boats, during this time. Boat it's engines. Really clogged toilets. Boat engines. Oh, boat engines to get the hell off of, out of the, the country. Uh, <laughs> don't! But, but if you have to. Yes. If you're so moved uh, by your inner uh, child to pick up a camera, um, I mean, really stay sober about this big career choice hmm. and make really smart decisions. Don't give all your money to a school with the, the promise that they're going to arm you with the tools and the career possibilities because they won't. You don't won't. need anyone but yourself in an Internet connection to be a self-taught success story. So don't spend money on a film school. I'm sorry. I, that pisses off a lot of people who are still in debt to their film schools. But you don't need that static anymore because you've got the only tool you need um, to start creating. Oh, no. There, yeah, there's um, so much so much education out there, either free or even paid at a much, much more affordable rate than it is to, to go to a film school, which honestly, when you start film school, if you go in there for four years, do you think everything you're learning is going to be even up to date by the time you're out? <laughs> Like, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, journalism schools up to three years ago, they still were focusing heavily on print. I mean, hello. Um, this is Sign of the Times calling. It's uh, 2020. Maybe you've heard. Yeah, it's it, it, it's a disservice. They really I mean, it's such a, a disservice because then you put someone in a vice grip, an economic vice grip. Oh, and it's around you your give neck. Them relevant information mm-hmm. and you get them on the hook for the next 20 years to pay you for information that won't produce a dime in their pocket. That pisses me off. It does. It's, it's uh, yeah. I mean, it's all about I, ROI. I, yeah. And you have to stay focused on that. And some some of the peers will say, oh, no, but I, I'm an artiste. I fix my beret. I can't focus on the money. But if you don't focus on the money, you'll never have the backing to create your art and buy your berets. So there, there's a balance. <laughs> and your monocle. Don't forget the monocle. Oh. Um, the monocle, sir. Um, and, and let me ask you. Uh, I went to film school. But I went to a trade school. I went to Full sale, And my, my education was fairly affordable um, at the time. Uh, ask me how many times I've shown my degree or have been asked for my degree. Uh, Alex, how many times have you shown your degree? Never once. Has what? 
anyone asks me, where did you go to school? Let me see your degree. What are your qualifications? Where's your, they just go, can you do the job I'm going to hire you to do? Do you have a reel? Do you have a resume? Do you have references? That's all I care about. We are carnies. And the sooner people understand that we're te- high tech carnies, that's what the film industry is built we on. Are. High tech carnies who either are in post in a closet like I was for many years or on set directing or on set, you know, doing other jobs. You are a carny in one way, shape, or high tech carny. And in the carny world, they don't care about credentials. <laughs> no. But in the carny world, it's all about your game. Yep. It has to stop someone for a second, catch an eye, hook a heart, Correct. grab someone, and then it's your patter. And you have to bring something very different that someone else in that marketplace can't bring. So once again, it's really getting in touch with your unique, I'm sorry for the cliche, unique value offering to the world. And you can't be scared off by maybe going down a different path. Um, it's so important to stand out these days and have the courage to be your unique self. Because oh. the market wants that. I mean, we're in this era of you know authenticity and uh, authentic storytelling as a currency. So lean into that. I think that's what the market really wants more of these days. It's the only um, value. One you more have. tip: Th- this episode's going on three hours, but I thank you Skype for not shutting the servers down. Um, another tip for for young filmmakers, sure. and this really helped me, uh, especially if you're thinking about going into documentary. Mm-hmm. I learned so much of every facet of the process by working in TV news. Because you have to be a one man band, um, and it may not it may be cause an eye roll. Oh, I don't want to tell those kind of stories. No, you're not there for that. You eventually will tell the stories you want to tell, but you learn every facet of the technical process, and you become very quick, and that is really key. I don't want filmmakers laboring for five years. There's zero ROI if you spend five years on a project. Um, you need to turn your, your 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 productions around much quicker and spend less money on them. That's yeah, just, yeah. Like you made your you made your film for fifteen thousand dollars, and that's not that's doable because of your tools and the toolbox you've put over the years. Hundred percent. Or else, if you would have to pay people to do your jobs, oh. and you would just be the artist, don't forget, if you were just the artist and you had your beret, that's a hundred fifty, two hundred thousand, two hundred fifty thousand dollar job. Um, film. And same thing goes with yep. me with my last film. I I, I spent around three thousand dollars making my feature, oh but my it was. God. But it was a you know it was a different ball game. You, but it was a, yeah. a, I just did a lot of it myself and hired key people that I and when I say key, there's three, um, you know, other than wow. the actors and you. But I did that because I have twenty odd years under my belt and I have a lot of tools in my toolbox and I carried a lot of that weight on my own shoulders. If not, that movie cost you know a hundred thousand bucks, you know, if we do it right. There's no way to get that back as indie filmmakers, where a lot of us are. So you right. really have to um, to learn the craft so you can perform at all levels of it, not rely on others. Mm-hmm. And we know people, older filmmakers, who still bring on a, a DP, a sound person, and they have to hire a crew of five, which maybe you and I can single handedly do. Correct, uh, correct. And it's all just different. But and and try, I think the generation coming up behind us uh, and behind them, uh, they're very self sufficient and they're handling definitely. And that's exciting. That is exciting. Yes. Now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Um, this sounds really crappy. Uh, it, it, it's, it's multifaceted. Um, nobody gives a damn. Oh, absolutely. About your film. Oh, they don't. Or, or you. And that is um, – it's liberating once you can lean into that. Zero expectations from the world or your audience. Uh, and it's on us to help people care about something that is important to us. And you can find a common ground to where people will lean in a little if you're offering them something of value. But also, uh, you're not a slave to what the, the market thinks of your work. If this, if this project causes you joy while you're creating it, wow, that is 100% ROI. Your happiness um, during the creation process is huge. That can never be discounted. And we forget that once we labor for a year or two, we, we put it online and it just flops. And we think because we got 1,253 views, it's a failure. But we, we forget how much, you know, fun we had and how much we learned mm-hmm. during the process of making it. Yes. Without question. Great answer. And three of your favorite films of all time. I knew you were going to ask that. Uh, it honestly, I'm not a real film guy. Uh, Th- three of your favorite documentaries. 
Fa- documentaries. No, I, okay, I do have some favorite. My favorite film is Airplane. Oh, Far so I don't good. know if anyone's ever given you that answer. Yes. Oh, it has. It's been on the show. It's a fantastic. Oh, really? You could turn on Airplane right now and piss yourself. Yes. It's so funny. I picked the wrong day to start sniffing glue. I mean, it's just right. so good. You ever been in a cockpit? You ever seen a grown man naked? Um, <laughs> Did you spend any time in? No, do you like watching asking. barbar? Do you like uh, watching barbarian films, Johnny? Have you ever seen? Yeah. Have you spent any time in a Turkish prison? In a Turkish prison? <laughs> like it's just like it's and, so good. And there's Easter eggs throughout that you could watch oh. it like ten times and you'll find something new oh, to laugh so at. So good, so good. And it's I actually I sat on the plane um, next to we were going to Beijing for a project um, next to one of the. I'm, I'm blanking on who are the two guys. Um, J A is it J Abrams J, Abrams Abrams and Zucker 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 Zuckerman. I sat next to Zucker Zucker, Zucker Jerry Zucker. Uh, yeah, Jerry, yeah. Um, hilarious guy, but uh, I mean, I love quirky. I mean, there's a guy I wrote this guy's name down because I love uh, Stephen Conrad. He he uh, on the TV. He's the uh, per- Perpetual Grace, the Patriot on Amazon. He did Secret Life of Walter Mitty. Oh yeah, um, have you heard of him? Oh, I love Secret Life of Walter Mitty. It was a great film. I love quirky, um, just different. Fair enough. Now, where can people uh, find you and your work? <laughs> As if they want to after this. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone's still listening, they don't want. I don't know. Go, go to um, uh, moviemarketingmakeover.com. dot uh, com. That's how you can get this free course. You could find me there. I mean. I don't know. You can find. Oh, I have a company, by the way. I've only had it for like 25 years, but I have a production company called Content Media Group uh, here in Los Angeles. So you could find me there too. Uh, I love, you know, opening an ear to the, the the up and coming generation of filmmakers. So feel free to reach out with any questions. But we're all here to support each other and to keep indie filmmaking alive into the future. Amen, sure. brother. Preach, sir. Preach, preach. <laughs> yes. Hallelujah. <laughs> amen, sir. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Woo, pass the plate. Jeff, uh, thank you so much for being on the show, man. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, and uh, thank you for being so honest and raw about uh, your experience. Thank you for allowing me to uh, beat it up a little bit for the the scope of education of our audience. I do truly appreciate it because I think we do learn much more from our mistakes than we do from our, our victories, as I have put my mistakes out there in many, many ways, <laughs> many times in my books and everywhere else. Um, but I think it's really great of you. So thank you again for everything you've uh, done and good luck to you with uh, Launch 2.0. And thank you for keeping us all awake to the possibilities of what we can uh, become as indie filmmakers, Alex. Thank you for building this great community. I want to thank Jeff for coming on the show, not only dropping major, major knowledge bombs on the tribe, but for being so transparent and open about his successes and his failures going through this journey of self-distributing his film. Self-distribution, guys, is no joke. If you are going to self-distribute your film, you really have to be on your A game. The higher the budget of your film, the tougher it's going to be to recoup your money in today's world. So try to keep those budgets as low as possible. But the higher that budget goes, the better you have to execute your plan. And you have to have a plan in the first place before you try to self-distribute it. If you plan on just putting your movie out there on iTunes and Amazon and Google Play and YouTube and you expect you know, people to find your movie and that's how you're going to make your money back in self-distribution, I promise you, you will more than likely fail because that is not an option anymore in today's world. So I talk all about uh, distribution and, and a lot of the, the pitfalls of distribution, what you can do to actually generate revenue with your film in my best-selling book, Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, which, of course, you can get at filmbizbook.com. Now, if you want to get links to anything we talked about in this episode, head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 41 to for the show notes. And before I finish today, guys, I want to let you know that I've got some insane stuff cooking for the tribe. We will be having a bunch of amazing things happening for the last two months of this insanely crazy upside down year that is 2020. I have a bunch of new courses, webinars, things like that that are coming out for the tribe through IFH Academy. We're adding a bunch of new content over at Indie Film Hustle TV 
as well. And of course, I'm going to be announcing my new book towards the end of the year, which I am feverishly working on as we speak. Thank you again so, so much. As always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. Stay safe out there, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. 